they're a summertime tradition. Each season, a new generation of rides explode upon the scene as designers race to offer the latest adrenaline rush. People have a demand for excitement, demand for challenge, demand for thrills. But as we push the envelope to develop new thrills, how far can we go? There's going to be higher speeds, uh, there's going to be taller coasters, and there's going to be more excitement on them. Yet as thrill rides become more radical, have they led to more serious accidents? I just started screaming and like crying and stuff, and I was like, this isn't happening to me. Join us as we explore the fine line between thrill ride safety and thrill ride fun. As far as I'm concerned, they can fly me to the moon and drop me back there. Beast, the Exterminator, the Mind Eraser. Their names alone are conceived to terrify. Today, roller coasters are being built bigger, faster, and scarier than ever before. It's all part of the package, part of the ultimate thrill. As coaster designers ratchet high anxiety to an almost unbearable intensity. It's how you create the unexpected. So uh, a thrilling ride is one where the guests feel very excited, very stimulated. Maybe even they feel a little bit unsafe. There really aren't any limits, really, from the standpoint of how you conceive and how you conceptualize ideas. It's important not to put limits in your head as far as what you're thinking and what you're trying to create. But as thrill ride designers push the limits of creativity, they must also keep their creations safe. Safety has always been and always will be an, an obsession with the theme park industry. And that's really the word that describes it, an obsession. Every aspect we get involved with, whether it be the initial concept, the design, the fabrication, the installation, the testing prior to the turnover to the park, every one of those elements has safety as its focus. Yet each new season, roller coaster designers engage in a virtual arms race, constantly pushing the thrill ride envelope to the outer limits of fear. Designers use a lot of what we call tricks of the trade in order to make thrill rides even more exciting. Proximity is, uh, is an important thing. Proximity to other elements. And there was times when you came so close to the ground, you thought you were going to, like, touch it. Portions of the ride might intertwine, and you might be heading towards a portion of the ride, and just at the last split second, the vehicle banks away, and you barely miss that, that element of the ride. There's a certain thrill about, you know, the near miss. There's a certain thrill about coming, you know, perilously close to a, a static object object at you know really high speeds that uh, you know and being able to duck out of the way in the last minute that takes you to the edge. Like we went over the shack and like we were going and you thought you were gonna bang into it but you didn't. Another thing that you do is you accentuate the speed on a ride by trying to keep it close to the ground. People have the ability from their perception to actually see objects on the ground. They think they're going faster. Today's coasters don't just seem to be going faster, they are faster. One of the designers responsible is Jim Shea, who introduced linear induction motors to thrill rides. Shea's coaster at the Sahara Hotel in Las Vegas is aptly named Speed. You're sitting in your vehicle, the launch operator launches your vehicle, and you instantly accelerate like you're in a rocket sled. Your body's pushed back against the seat. You're accelerated in this magnetic wave zone and shot out of the Sahara Hotel, make a sharp turn, go underground, through a loop, and shoot you over 70 miles an hour, and eventually traveling up to over 200 feet in the air, and then coming backwards on the same path into the station. I mean, it's a very, very intense ride. Unlike automobiles, there is no speed limit for thrill rides. We reached that holy grail of thrill seekers going 100 miles an hour on a coaster. We're the first and so far only 100 mile an hour coaster, Superman the Escape, at Six Flags Magic Mountain in California. We are seeing traditional coasters uh, approaching that 100 mile an hour barrier. 
as coasters continue to get taller and faster. Here we go. Watch this start now. Paul Rubin is a roller coaster guru. Oh, this will be fun. Here we go. Whoa! An expert on the history of All coasters right. and an active participant in the world of thrills. Paul has ridden over 600 different coasters around the world. I enjoy the sense of being out of control. So much of our life is in control. So much of it is mundane. Uh, something unusual is fun. Uh, I've done it all my life. I still enjoy it. This is good. This is very, very good. Paul's job as editor of Park World, an amusement park magazine, takes him across the country and around the globe, testing, reviewing, photographing, and riding the most radical coasters. A daily dose of adrenaline is just another part of the job. The most extreme position I've ever been on a coaster probably is way out of my seat. Uh, last fall, I had the opportunity to visit Stan Chekets for a media preview of Thrust Air 2000, his new air launch coaster. We were launched from zero to 80 miles an hour within two seconds, at which point you go straight up 172 foot tower, roll over the top, and then straight down the other side. But speed and awesome acceleration aren't the only new twists in the race to make thrill rides more terrifying. Some designers are taking the very notion of what a coaster is to new, unexplored territory. David Batcher fashioned his obsession with flight into Stealth, one of the world's most unique roller coaster rides. Stealth gives its riders the unique sensation of being strapped underneath a barrel rolling jet fighter. Start the first bend and roll over into the flying position, and now I'm like Superman, hanging in the harness, taking a dive down, picking up speed, going into the most extreme of my favorite part of the ride, which is the loop. In the top of the loop, we hang, dive down, pulling nearly 5G. Thrill ride designers want to give us a ride we'll never forget, one that combines absolute exhilaration with sheer terror. Everyone enjoys the imagined danger of riding a roller coaster, but that's exactly what it is. It's imagined. Uh, the reality of the situation is you're much safer riding a roller coaster than you are driving to an amusement park. You're safer riding a coaster. This is according to the U.S. Product Safety Commission statistics. Safer than playing billiards, safer than using toothpicks, safer than any other form of transportation. But inspections and statistics become meaningless when accidents do happen. On March 21, 1999, 28-year-old secondary school counselor Valerie Cartwright entered the Roaring Rapids attraction at Six Flags in Arlington, Texas. Roaring Rapids is a twirling roller coaster water ride in which a raft navigates three intense rapids. But when Valerie's sister Monica and her brother Duane began the ride with Valerie, they didn't know it would be the last time they would see her alive. It was a round raft. Um, it was like uh, in a tube on the outside part, as far as I can remember. I looked down and I remember seeing a lot of water on the bottom. I knew it was a water ride and a lot of water rides, the bottoms are wet, so I never knew that, you know, it was unusual or anything that was different. But as they made their way down the course, their raft began taking on more and more water. The third dip is when everything just really got bad. It was like, well, when it hit that last little dip, you could hear it just hit something real hard. And uh, right then, it just, it was just quick. There was nothing you could do to stop it. The boat, which was carrying 12 passengers, capsized. All of them became trapped upside down underneath the ride in the water. And I was like, Lord, I can't hold my breath anymore. And that was it. I think my head hit something and I went out. I was looking around to see where everybody else was at. And uh, at this time, uh, the two guys had jumped in to help us. They had took off some of the other seatbelts. And I, I was looking around to see maybe that Valerie had already gotten out, but I didn't see it. The staff was running around, but no one was going in the water to really rescue the people. Wendy Crowd was waiting in line. 
When she saw the boat capsize, she immediately dove into the chilly waters. I jumped into the water and swam to the raft, and uh, there was people um, not breathing. I saw a black woman there who, who was not breathing, and so I started mouth to mouth on her. Wendy tried to breathe life into Valerie, but she could not bring her back. It's just hard. It's just hard for me. It's hard for my family. I mean, Valerie, to me, she was young. She was my baby sister. But just to go out on a trip to an amusement park to have fun and my sister's killed, it's just, it's just hard to take. Valerie Cartwright was the first guest killed in the park's 39-year history. Investigators believe the accident occurred when the raft deflated, causing it to hit an underwater pipe. The force of the rushing water then flipped the boat over. The Cartwright family has filed a wrongful death suit against the park. Since the tragedy, the ride has been modified and is currently running. Whenever there's an accident, uh, whoever's ride is on, it's something that's taken very, very seriously in the industry to understand exactly what has caused it um, and what we can do to make the rides even safer than they are today. But when someone is killed, the shock is magnified because no one expects to die on a ride designed for enjoyment. Coming up next, as thrill rides become more radical, how much stress can the human body take? Go, 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 go! This TLC program is sponsored in part by Mercedes-Benz, the new C-Class. Visit us on the web. I'm not quite sure how to tell you this. What is it? You've only got 40 years left to live. Maybe 45, 50 times. Nature made it. Minwax makes it beautiful with rich wood stains and long-lasting protective finishes. Turning a house into a beautiful home is as easy as turning to Minwax. You see cars with nameplates like these on the hood. Mercedes-Benz AMG, Dodge Viper, Aston Martin. But did you know there's another nameplate underneath it? Here, Mobile One, Corvette, Porsche, all these cars come with Mobile One in the engine and the recommendation to keep on using it. You don't have a car like that? Me neither. But it only costs a little more to treat mine the same. Nothing outperforms Mobile One. One year ago today, Jim Horner had an important choice to make. Should he read the Wall Street Journal online or look for new business ideas from some other website? Fortunately, Jim decided to go to WSJ.com where he found constantly updated news, helping him start a highly successful web-based tech company, which helped Jim live out another one of his dreams. Imagine what the journal could do for you. Now, get a 30-day free trial of the Wall Street Journal online. Log on to WSJ.com now. Human drama. Creativity. Are you human? <laughs> Violence on the streets means a very busy ER. Four critical patients, one crazy night. Code Blue, Monday at 8 on TLC. I am an athlete. I don't know what makes me play harder. They say it's science. I call it heart. Feel the footsteps, feel the hit. Unleash your champion when TLC presents a heart-pounding television event. Tuesday and Wednesday on TLC. And our Craftmatic Model 2 adjustable bed is so relaxing. It may even temporarily provide relief from my low back pain, Harry. Yet it costs up to 56% less than a quality flatbed. I adjust my head and feet and fall right to sleep. Call toll-free to get free information by mail about the Craftmatic Model 2 adjustable bed. This wonderful bed adjusts to hundreds of relaxing positions, offers optional warm, soothing heat, and relaxing built-in massage, yet costs up to 56% less than these quality flat beds. Up to 56% less! Don't pay more to remain flat. Call toll-free and get complete free facts by mail about the adjustable bed that costs up to 56% less.
Call to get Craftmatic's free catalog right away. There's absolutely no obligation. Call toll-free 1-800-587-4646. That's 1-800-587-4646, toll-free. 1-800-587-4646. Today, as coasters grow taller and scarier every year, each park wants the bragging rights to having the most inversions, the biggest, fastest, or wildest ride. But how do they try to ensure that their rides are safe? Carly Ward is a biomechanical engineer, an expert in injury evaluation. Her company specializes in computer and video simulations of accidents and injuries. Through research over the years, we've determined what the human body can tolerate. Interpreting that and uh, making it relevant to the ride is not well known. And that's why we have to go out and measure to make sure that we don't exceed the human tolerance. One device used is an accelerometer, which translates motion and speed into g-forces. G-forces are multiples of gravity, the force that pulls bodies and objects toward Earth. At rest, the body experiences 1G, or simple gravity. When a big roller coaster changes direction or banks around a curve at high speeds, it can generate forces up to five times that of gravity. It's a natural reaction for your body to fight off the, some of the things that the ride's going to do to you. But we, know, we all know they're safe, and we all know they've been tested and everything. But, you know, your body's still going to tell you, no, this isn't safe. But that's one of the biggest thrills we get from riding. It is a phenomenon that is potentially dangerous. Or if riders are not restrained safely, the forces applied to their body could lift them out of the vehicle. But now, with the help of special computers, designers are taking thrill rides to the very edge of what the human body can tolerate. Astronauts during takeoff experience extremely high g-forces. Although many thrill rides exhibit similar g-forces, they only last for fractions of a second. People like to always say, ooh, that ride you know, has you know, four g's, it has three g's. And you know, the, the actual g-force that a person feels has a lot of different parameters that are considered in the design. It's not only the magnitude of the g-force, but it's also how quickly the g-force is applied to your body, what they call the onset of the g-force. And also what's important is how long the body is experiencing that g-force for. In order to determine how long high g-forces are applied, Carly Ward has incorporated accelerometers into an instrument which measures g-force stress to the head. This is another one of our employees wearing the headgear. We're looking for head accelerations that uh, could be outside the normal. Uh, and to s particularly we're using a woman because women have uh, weaker necks. And uh, we read those traces and analyze and it'll tell you exactly what the head is doing. We can tell you how the head moves uh, in three dimensions. We can recreate that then in our computer later. Researchers like Carly Ward have helped the industry come up with new safety designs for the more stressful rides. There are several things about uh, rides that can make them more dangerous, um, and let's exclude malfunctions of the ride itself. But, um, for example, the braces you put on the person when uh, you get in, you want those braces to be padded. You don't want to be the person banging their head on the brakes. You have to design it so that the spine is not injured or the st neck is not overstressed. Safety experts like Carly Ward don't only conduct tests on the movements of the human body, they also test the movements of the thrill rides as well. Every kind of precaution you could take, we take. You know, we, we mock things up, we study them in, in full scale, uh, we test them in the environment. We do whatever it takes to make sure that we're completely confident that what we're delivering is the safest experience possible. Yet recently, in England and Japan, some doctors are warning that the newest and most intense thrill rides could be linked to neurological injuries that include strokes and blood clots on the brain. Injuries usually associated with trauma to the head. Injuries 
In one case, Japanese doctors believe a healthy 24-year-old Japanese woman suffered a subdural hematoma, or bleeding, on the surface of the brain after a day of riding three different roller coasters. One of them, the Fujiyama, is one of the world's highest roller coasters, with a drop of 259 feet and speeds of up to 81 miles per hour. The Japanese are not claiming that she hit her head. They're just claiming that she rode the coaster and afterwards it had these subdural hematomas. I wouldn't say that these injuries are going to be the norm because they're very rare. But the battle between creating an exciting ride and providing a safe one have always been part of the amusement park industry. Because the roller coaster arms race is nothing new. In fact, it's hundreds of years old. The history of roller coasters is surprising because that all-American thrill ride, the roller coaster, really had its beginnings in Russia nearly 400 years ago. There, an enterprising showman from St. Petersburg discovered people would pay to be terrified. He built wooden slides, covered them with ice, and would charge people to go down the hill on small sleds. In the United States, roller coasters were born in the 1870s when mining cars were converted to passenger use in the mountains of Pennsylvania. The ride was called the Mock Chunk Railway. The cars that used to carry coal now flew downhill filled with screaming passengers. During the home stretch, the train reached speeds of nearly 60 miles an hour. People sat on park benches, there were no lap bars, there were no uh, seat belts, and during its years of operation from 1873 until it was dismantled in 1937, no one was ever injured. Yet people were injured when thrill ride designers first came up with the unique idea of turning people upside down in early looping coasters. Looping coasters in North America first appeared in 1895 uh, at Coney Island, which turns out to be the nuclear test ground of almost every new roller coaster ride, uh, they built a looping coaster called the Flip Flap. Uh, there are a couple problems, however, with the Flip Flap. The forces required to keep people in their seats were so severe, many people suffered neck or back strain. As a result, all the early looping roller coasters disappeared. But perhaps the most terrifying and deadly coaster ever built was the one erected in 1927 outside Buffalo, New York, the dreaded Crystal Beach Cyclone. It was the only roller coaster to have a nurse on duty at the loading platform full time and with good reason. As riders came down the first 97 foot drop, the track veered 85 degrees to the right. People would lose hats, combs, purses, false teeth. They'd be thrown into the riding park as cracking ribs. There was a fatality there back in 1943. A gentleman got on with a jacket on, started up the lift hill, stood up, started to take his jacket off, uh, got his arms locked behind him, couldn't get the jacket off, couldn't sit down, and when the train went over the top of the hill, he was tossed out and killed. Today's thrill rides are more popular than ever. An average of 300 million people visit amusement parks annually. But with so many people riding so many rides, the chance of accidents increases. The summer of 1999 was a case in point, for during that season, six people died on thrill rides. June 11, 1999, a day of fun at Coney Island, New York, turns into tragedy. 17-year-old Nadine Caban and her family when the car she is riding in breaks free, pinning her beneath it. A hook that connects the cars of the Super Himalaya snapped. The car Nadine was riding flipped over. Riders say when the ride went in reverse, debris began to fall. Some people even jumped out of their speeding cars. Eight people received minor injuries. But Nadine wasn't so lucky. She died an hour after the incident. Her whole life just started now, so, but now it's gone, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to hold on strongly here, because it's not, it's not easy. But the summer of tragedy wasn't over. In August, within the same week, four other passengers were killed on thrill rides. One of them involved a mother and her child. On August 28th, Kim Bailey and her eight-year-old daughter Jessica were killed when the coaster car they were riding in plunged backward down a steep incline and rounding a curve, ejected them. After
after the accident, a state investigation revealed problems with the car's anti-rollback device and safety bar mechanism. You know, it, it could have been any one of these kids, but they definitely don't want to do it again. And my kids don't want to go on rides anymore for a while. In America, on average, only two people a year die on amusement park rides. The odds of being seriously injured are about one in 250 million. I think whenever someone is injured in the pursuit of fun, it's news. It's newsworthy, the media is doing their part. However, there is a tendency to sensationalize it. Uh, in other incidents where there are more fatalities, it's more commonly accepted. It's just not accepted uh, to be hurt on an amusement ride. Coming up next, roller coasters are only in them, and no coaster can protect a rider determined to be reckless. Put your arms around me, bunny, the stars above. Goose down jackets from Land's End. At $68, they're just about the warmest thing on the planet. www.net to register today. You know, when you apply for a loan in today's economy, it's nice to have the confidence that your credit is good, especially when you need a new home, car, or other essential. But sometimes inaccuracies do appear in your credit report, and that's why it's so important to stay on top of your credit by checking your report from time to time. Now it's easy and it's free. To get a free copy of your credit report, simply log on to freecreditreport.com. Act now. Get your free credit report by logging on to freecreditreport.com today. Are you human? On TLC, a special pulse-pounding lineup. We live the unbelievable. Oh, my God. This is one of the few cases that all of us will remember for a very long time. Then, a lucky man shocks Oakland's ER. We got shot before. You've been collecting bullets. And on an all-new code blue, residents in training struggle for control. You think that bullet went through your chest, okay? You can get through this. You're doing good. It's all here, tonight at 8 on TLC. When great television high-tech shows make you want more tech action, go to discovery.com and click on tech. Find unique interactives that actually let you build your own roller coaster or dig a super tunnel. Search our aviation files for more on high-tech planes or take a virtual tour of an aircraft carrier. And bookmark our site for news and information on the latest gadgets. Discover something new every day. Go to discovery.com. Click on tech. Though today's thrill rides are going to extremes to push the limits of speed and excitement, they are designed to be safe. There's going to be higher speeds, uh, there's going to be taller coasters, and there's going to be more excitement on them. And they'll be, they'll be safer and safer and safer as they get built. I think everyone enjoys testing the edge. Not everyone can be a race car driver, not everyone can be a skydiver. Uh, roller coasters provide that same thrill, they do it safely. A good coaster ride will get your heart pounding and get your adrenaline rushing. It'll make you feel alive. Paul Rubin estimates he has ridden thrill rides over 12,000 times. He has never had an accident and believes even the most extreme rides are safe. But Paul isn't America's only obsessed thrill ride test driver. Coming out of your seat, coming out of your seat, negative G-forces. Weightlessness. Controlled chaos. People who are excited about theme entertainment want to know what's coming next. 
especially pro-ride people who we call foamers. Um, if you get excited about you know anything in themed entertainment, you know you're like foaming at the mouth. They are called the American Coaster Enthusiasts, or ACE, a group of over 30,000 psyched up thrill seekers. We talk about coasters ad infinitum, ad nauseum, and just have a hell of a good time. And it's not just roller coasters. We are park enthusiasts. We enjoy all the stupid rides in a park, from the biggest to the smallest, and just have a great time and whoop it up, and people can look at us like we're crazy people. We are. The American Coaster Enthusiasts group is a combination of, of thrill seekers and people who are avidly determined to quantify the ride and quantify the thrill of the ride. Sweet mother of pearl, and there's no messing around, straight into that first hill out of the get-go, and then it's like you're looking straight down, baby. Woo! The only thing between you and the ground is that strap holding you in. But no safety provisions can protect riders who are determined to ignore them. Some riders will actually court danger in an effort to increase what's known as airtime. Airtime is the exhilarating sensation common to today's thrill rides when riders are momentarily free of the forces of gravity. It's the only place you can get a negative G level without going into a high performance aircraft. Airtime is one of the reasons why these large uh, 200 foot towers are showing up where you drop or free fall down in a carriage that has no connection to anything other than a guide rail. But to maximize this ultimate rush, some thrill seekers will actually loosen their safety restraints. When I would go to an amusement park, I would worry about hard mechanical failures, and those are fairly rare in this industry. What is far more common and is the cause of probably most of the accidents is rider error. And some of that's deliberate. It's the high, it's the adrenaline. But the only bad part about it, they need to go a little faster. Loosen the belt up, don't yeah. sit in as tight. Pick your feet up when you're on drops. If riders uh, loosen the restraints, perhaps to get more air, to feel more comfortable, that's not a good thing. They should wear the restraints as snugly as possible. But if I loosen the restraint and the restraint's not against my body, if the coaster or whatever I'm riding slows abruptly, then I'm going to slam into that restraint. People who stand up on roller coasters no. and try to defeat no. restraints, they no. should be ejected from the park. Um, all they do is cause more roller coasters to have more restraints put on them, and they make it less fun for the rest of us who want to ride responsibly and just have fun. Statistics show that reckless riders account for up to 80% of thrill ride fatalities. One death in 1999 was reported to be directly related to rider misbehavior. On August 23rd, Timothy Fan was riding the Shockwave at Paramount's Kings Dominion Park in Virginia. It's a stand-up coaster featuring steep vertical loops, which require riders to wear a safety shoulder harness and a waist level guard. Timothy's coaster had completed all the twists and loops and had accelerated around a final 180 degree turn at about 40 miles per hour when Timothy was ejected from the ride. He died from head injuries sustained on a metal walkway below the track. Investigators say that Timothy had somehow freed himself from his safety restraint, but Fan's family disputes the charge. Since they are potentially dangerous at the entrance of almost every thrill ride, signs are posted which warn riders about the potential prohibitions and dangers of the ride they are about to experience. Sometimes rider error can be attributed to just not paying attention. A lot of people, when they're in a park, don't bother to read signs. They make an assumption that they will be told how to, how to hold, how to behave, and what this ride is going to do, and they make other assumptions about the safety devices on the ride and how they work. Instead of reading the signs, they just do and sometimes that can create a problem. But how do you keep young children who can't read and don't always follow instructions safe? The most serious place where signage becomes a problem is in kiddie rides. And a lot of, of small children are injured because the ride operator says, keep your hands and feet inside the car. They don't listen to strangers. 
And really, the right operator should be talking to mom and pop and saying, please tell your kid, keep their hands and feet inside the car and pay attention to what I'm telling them so they'll have a lot of fun on this ride. These are very young children, and they have written warnings, but, you know, David was five. He couldn't understand the written warning, and, and it's not tar the warnings are not targeted to parents to watch their kids' body parts. Kathy Fackler's son, David, was seriously injured in California in 1998 on Disneyland's Big Thunder Mountain Railway. He was riding with his mother when his foot became wedged between the car and the track. We had the lap bar in place, you know, across our laps. And as the train comes into the station, it makes a temporary stop about, I don't know, 10, 20 feet before the, the platform. And I believe it's some kind of a safety thing. But the man who was riding behind us said it looked like David mistook that for the end of the ride and tried to get off. And my arm, you know, because my arm was around his shoulders and the lap bar was in place, it kept his body in, but his foot came out the open side. And the people who were waiting on the platform yelled to stop the ride and that his foot's out. But it never occurred to me that they were yelling at me be because I had my arms around my kids. And the ride operator didn't see it in time, and they couldn't stop the ride. And so as the, as the car came into the, started up again and came into the station, his foot was pinned between the, the platform and the side of the car, and the force of it tore it virtually in half. David was pinned to the track for 20 minutes before rescue workers could remove him. He spent 25 days in the hospital, but has now made a full recovery. Since David's accident, Kathy Fackler has spearheaded an effort to get better accident report information from amusement parks. I would like to see reasonable, low-level regulation, both at the state level and at the federal level. All I'd like to see at the federal level is nationwide accident reporting of some level, broken bones, etc., that goes into a central database just to process it through so that we know what's out there. Yet considering her family's tragic experience, Kathy Fackler's research into the amusement park industry has led her to a surprising conclusion. I feel that I know the dangers a little bit better now. And not just through David's accident, but through all of the research that I've done and the people that I've talked to. And, and so I think that parks are extraordinarily safe considering what goes the mechanical you know nature of them um, if you're aware that you're loading your children onto heavy machinery you have to have that kind of mindset going into it and then you treat the machines with respect rather than just counting on the fact that they're perfect after his recovery David and Kathy decided to try the ride again I talked to him about it, and we talked our way through it, and I told him, you know, don't be afraid of, the, of what happened to you. It won't happen again. That won't happen again. You keep your feet inside. I will keep my arm around your shoulder, and we'll get through here just fine. And he eventually did, and we went, had a great ride, and, you know, and life goes on, and life goes on. Coming up next, when accidents do happen, lives can be held in the balance, sometimes hundreds of feet above the ground. I just started screaming and like crying and stuff. You worry about your car lasting? Imagine going 500 miles in one stretch and 200 miles an hour. That can zap the life right out of your car. That's why my team has always used Havlin Motor Oil, the same unique formulation you can get for your car. Take it. That's the kind of protection I'm talking about. Why aren't you guys working? And for five-year, 150,000-mile cooling system protection, try Havilland Extended Life Antifreeze. I registered my knowledge. I registered my hope. I registered my ambition. Visit register.com or call 1-800-5-WWW-NET to register today. Is there an insurance company with a 146-year history of proving that your trust is not misplaced? Without question, the St. Paul. What do I know about performance? 
What do I know about control? What do I know about grip? Great horsepower! Limited slip, rear differential. Full time, all wheel drive. But what do we know? We're just girls. Subaru Forester. Sport utility tough, car easy. I'm an athlete. I don't know what makes me run faster, hit harder. They watch tapes, review my technique. They say it's science. I call it something else. Heart. TLC puts you in the bodies of the world's greatest athletes so you can feel the sweet spot, hear the footsteps, the amazing science of sports. Tuesday and Wednesday on TLC. Sponsored in part by Mail Station. One touch email without the PC. AARP is an organization for people who are out to pasture. All washed up. And for everyone who's over the hill. AARP. We're a little different than you might think. Sure, our members are putting their feet up, but they're definitely not retiring. They're just like you. They're in their 50s. They're fit, fun, and ready for more. Call now to become a part of AARP. Membership is just $10. With your membership, you'll get a subscription to a great magazine. You'll also get all kinds of information on finances, health, fitness, and nutrition, and benefits too, like investment opportunities and insurance programs. Join today for $10 and your spouse becomes a member free. So if you're 50 or older, call now and join. With your membership card, you can even take advantage of an AARP discount or two, which is nice when you're riding off into the sunset. Some of the newest and costliest innovations in thrill rides are mega coasters. One of the most extreme is Millennium Force at Cedar Point in Sandusky, Ohio. All right, everybody reach for the sky, guys. There we go. Oh, look at that. Whoa. Millennium Force costs $25 million to build, stands 310 feet tall, has an 80 degree first drop, and reaches speeds of up to 92 miles per hour. Whoa, whoa, up off our seats, that's good. I think with computer technology now, that's that and these new systems, linear induction, that sort of thing, the rides are going to get uh, maybe more intense. We've seen that in the last few years. You know, the coaster, the biggest drop used to be probably 100 feet, now we're seeing 300 foot drops. I mean, these things are massive. As thrill rides become more intense, computer modeling and sophisticated harnesses are designed to help keep riders safe. Yet despite these and other safety measures, mechanical failures sometimes happen. In July of 1997, at Opryland, USA, a broken piece of plastic surrounding the chain in the track stopped the hangman cold. Firefighters worked for six hours to rescue its 20 riders. Two years later, in Kentucky, on a ride called the Vampire, 27 riders found themselves in a similar situation, stalled mid-ride 60 feet in the air when a braking system malfunctioned. I just started screaming and like crying and stuff and I was like, this isn't happening to me. In both cases, no one was injured. After the hangman incident, the ride was repaired. But the vampire, which had previously experienced two other malfunctions, was dismantled and taken out of service. To help avoid mechanical malfunctions like these, most thrill rides are tested every day before anyone even enters the amusement park. The ride is run through a couple times with no one in it, then it's run through with uh, employees of uh, the park to make sure everything is safe and functioning. And of course they have periodic inspections. David Collins is an amusement park safety inspector. His job is to help find problems before they happen. We do a physical examination of the ride. I'm talking about getting down into the nuts and bolts, pulling panels down, looking inside, looking at wells, looking at wire, and looking at structure to make sure that it's sound. After you've done a physical, is you do a ride through. David rode the Colossus Coaster at Six Flags Magic Mountain in Valencia, California, and pointed out some of its safety devices. If you look at the top of the hill, you'll see two flags. Those flags tell the ride operator how fast the wind is and what direction it's going in so that they know when to shut the ride down if the wind's too strong or blowing in the wrong direction. 
As the coaster mounts the hill, the familiar clack-clack sound is part of an anti-rollback device, which prevents the car from slipping backwards. Once you're off the lift, you're on free fall. So here we go. Yeehaw! Safety brakes are located throughout the ride. They can determine when the coaster is going too fast and slow it down by squeezing the pad against the passing train. We're in free fall gravity all the way around this ride. As the ride progresses, sensors under the track tell the ride control computer when the train has passed safely. That's a safety stop station. And, and each section going. or block of the track is divided by brakes to prevent two trains from crashing into each other. down getting ready to come into the station the sensors are on the track there are two sensors everywhere we go to tell the computer that we're coming into the brakes that's a safety brake we just passed we're going to come up on the final trim brake two sensors slowing down and then these boost wheels will carry us into the station at a controlled speed a beautiful ride in a beautiful train on a beautiful day. As an independent safety inspector, David has worked in some of the biggest amusement parks in the United States. He works closely with each park's maintenance team, as well as those who operate the rides. The operational team is usually the first to know if a ride is malfunctioning. I, I don't care whether it's a Disney or a Universal or a Six Flags or, or any of the, of the majors. You'll find that the operator will call and say, I heard a funny noise and the maintenance techs will be out there within minutes to see what's going on. This is why the larger parks have such a great record. But some rides are not so rigorously monitored. Many smaller carnival rides move from state to state. Some have even slipped through or around safety inspections. And that may have been the reason for the deaths of 15-year-old Leslie Lane. On March 19, 1998, Leslie rode the Himalaya Thrill Ride at a Texas carnival with her brother and a friend. When their safety bar broke, they were flung out of their seat. Leslie was thrown into a wall and killed. Police investigators concluded that the ride was poorly maintained and that the restraint equipment was inadequate. The Himalaya Ride had been tagged for safety violations 14 times over seven years as it moved from state to state. Unlike some of the smaller and less sophisticated thrill rides in carnivals and traveling attractions, new roller coasters like Stealth employ an enormous amount of computerized safety devices. The DC is the DC motor at the top of the lift. For the, this is for the controller. This is for the chain start. This is the trim brakes over in the station over here. And a manual mode. This is if you're high pressure and you're low pressure. This opens them up. Safety brakes in the station, station area here. It's all different type of technology. Very different. Today, the large theme parks are providing rides that go light years beyond mere roller coasters. Many of these attractions bring people face to face with their worst fears. The backdraft attraction at Universal is a fascinating example of safety control because, uh, I mean, you are right there with fire you feel the radiant heat in your face and it is hot and we're sending up you know, thousands and thousands of BTU every six minutes in that attraction but what the audience doesn't see is multiple safety uh, systems throughout that won't allow the flames to fire if it's an unsafe condition. Safety is also paramount on ultra sophisticated rides which combine motion simulation, live action and film. In our Back to the Future attraction people often come out the back door and say how did you fit all that scenery into the building? Well there is no scenery whatsoever it's all projection and it's not just because the projected image is convincing it's because you've added enough other cues like heat, fog, Miss, to the point where your mind just says, this is really happening to me. Although riders might feel as if they are totally on their own, behind the scenes, their safety is being monitored through every twist, turn, and speed warp. In addition to all of the computer monitoring that we do and the safety systems and sensors if someone steps out of the 
correct place or if a door opens or something, we would know it immediately. But there's also always operators watching the attraction and having some kind of awareness of what the guests are doing. So that that's another whole level over and above the computer safety systems. I was in here when I had a, a potential guest jumper. We had it shut down the entire attraction just because a, a 14 or 15 year old kid wanted to surf on the vehicle. Safety has always been the number one priority. I think the awareness of the general public when you're doing more extreme rides has been raised. I think that's true. But safety as a design issue has always been the number one issue. Next, where will our insatiable obsession with thrill rides lead? Now, have you ever tried to flip an omelette? It's flipping impossible. And what about all that butter and fat that it takes just to cook it? Well, those days are over. This is my perfect omelette, the fast, easy way to make delicious omelettes without any added fat for picture-perfect results every time. Perfect omelette makes restaurant-style omelettes light and fluffy right from your microwave. Look, this ham and cheese omelette is a mile high and cooked to perfection, and it's simple to use. Just pour in the eggs, add your favorite filling, and voila, you've got a perfectly folded omelette. Make a two-egg omelette with cheese for the kids or a giant four-egg omelette with bacon and sausage for the man of the house. In fact, you can make any omelette with any filling in less than three minutes, like this Western omelette done in just two and a half minutes. In less time than it takes you to get out of the pan and grease it, you can have a perfect omelette, fast, flavorful, with no added fat. And clean up's a breeze. Just run it under the faucet or put it in the dishwasher. You can use it at home, in the RV, camper, or at work. And it's not just for omelettes. Make breakfast burritos, bacon, egg and cheese sandwiches, eggs benedict, even brownies. Call now and you get the perfect omelette plus my fast and flavorful recipe guide for just $19.95. But if you call in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to give you a second perfect omelette for free. But it gets even better because I'm also going to give you the amazing perfect chopper for free. Finely chopped onions with no tears and instantly diced peppers for a fabulous vegetarian omelette. This egg beater attachment whips and beats eggs quickly for their fluffiest tomato and basil omelette. Plus, this clever egg separator makes healthy egg white omelettes just as easy. It's the perfect partner to the perfect omelette, and it's yours free. This incredible $70 value is all yours for just $19.95. So call now. Call in the next 10 minutes to get a second perfect omelette and the chopper free. That's the $70 value for just $19.95. This amazing offer won't last. Call 1-800-225-9944. That's 1-800-225-9944. On TLC, a special pulse-pounding lineup. We live the unbelievable. Oh, my God. This is one of the few cases that all of us will remember for a very long time. Then, a lucky man shocks Oakland's ER. We got shot before. You've been collecting bullets. And on an all-new code blue, residents in training struggle for control. You think that bullet went through your chest, okay? You can get through this. You're doing good. It's all here tonight at 8 on TLC. The greatest names in professional sports. Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa, Brett Favre, Kina McCardo. Give you an inside look at a world where technology meets human performance. Where monsters of the gridiron expand their body-crushing potential through cyborg science. The big hitters use the physics of force to rip hits in record-breaking numbers. Unleash the champion inside you. The amazing science of sports. Tuesday and Wednesday on TLC. When great television how-to programs give you the urge to do it yourself, go to discovery.com and click on Lifestyles. Get inspiration from discovery daytime experts like Christopher Lowell and Lynette Jennings. Search their unique crafts and recipes from famous chefs. And bookmark our site for insight on everything from dating and relationships to weddings, babies, and parenting. Discover something new every day. Go to discovery.com, click on Lifestyles. 
As thrill rides become more and more sophisticated, and as the riders themselves search for new and more radical experiences, oh my God. how much further are we prepared to go in our search for the ultimate thrill ride? As a designer, there's a challenge there because you have to think of more creative ways to provide a more exciting environment for these people. So it really does challenge the designer to think more and to come up with ways to use technology more and use technology for thrills. I think today's generation demands that type of experience, the MTV generation as we call it. You need this constant barrage of stimulation, mental and physical stimulation. And then I think we'll see more creative uses of some of these technologies where people will add a story element to some of these experiences and make them a little more timeless, a little more engaging. As far as the themed attractions, I think as uh, computer animation continues to develop and HDTV, uh, large format films, you're going to see more and more combinations of traditional technologies and, and video technologies and all that sort of thing just to create these more immersive experiences. The most immersive rides are modern simulation attractions. In these, riders enter a car that tilts pneumatically or electrically. In many of the new simulated rides, riders wear 3D glasses. At iWorks Entertainment in Burbank, California, creative amusement park futurists are hard at work coming up with the next twist on immersion. Some of the effects that we're, we're working on right now are heat effects, which will uh, blast uh, uh, hot air at all the guests. Um, that seems to tie in with a lot of simulation films because there are always explosions or something like that going on. Um, also, scent effects seem to be very popular. We've been doing wind effects, and uh, we're also toying with water effects and audio effects and things like that. Yet to hardcore thrill ride designers, simulated rides just don't cut it. From a personal standpoint, I think coasters are hard to beat. Uh, that, you know, the, the rush of the air and the fact that you know that you're going up 200 feet in the air and you're wondering what's going to happen when you come down to the ground, now that's, that's a thrill that's hard to simulate. To some thrill ride futurists, roller coasters themselves may soon be a thing of the past. It's called Fly-By-Wire, a New Zealand invention that actually offers riders solo pilot control of a high-speed tethered aircraft. The rider, pilots, are strapped into a four-meter pod, suspended from cables 200 feet above the ground. The rider controls the engine, which is capable of speeds of over 100 miles per hour. It makes bungee jumping look tame. Plans are currently in the works to bring the attraction to the United States. But soon, we may be seeking thrills far above the Earth's atmosphere. Currently, 18 teams from around the world are competing for a $10 million prize to be the first to take private citizens into space. To claim the prize, the winners must take their passengers over 60 miles above the Earth. Here, they will be facing situations and stresses that astronauts spend months training to withstand. As far as I'm concerned, they can fly me to the moon and drop me back to Earth. How far can thrill rides go in pursuit of controllable danger? As the thrill ride designers' creativity and imagination fuses with high-tech computers, simulation, and virtual reality, we may soon come close to actually experiencing death itself. I don't think there's any limit of experience that couldn't be explored using theme park technology. Birth, death, and everything in between. Um, you begin to get in some really interesting psychological ground when you start out talking about reenacting your own death or your own birth or anything like that. Whether pushing the limits of human tolerance or a designer's imagination, today's thrill rides are not only technological marvels, but artistic masterpieces as well. There is a strange and hypnotic beauty to their motion. A uh, heavy metal ballet is how I kind of look at coasters now. You know, I say, look, this is like, you know, all drive and all power and all force. But there's an elegance to the moves. So that once you can kind of sync that up with some really great steep drops and great loops and corkscrews and zero-G moments, then you're really singing. As today's world gets more and more stressful, you know, as every minute becomes a work environment, there aren't a lot of ways to get away from it. And, you know, these thrill rides, they represent a way to get away totally and just have an amazing out-of-this-world experience.